So before we go on to our talk about our esteemed panelists, I just want to start by also introducing what the 20 Years Project is. It's an artistic and journalistic project. Um, it's a way to assess the legacy of the post sort of 9-11 US led war in Afghanistan. Today actually marks the 20 years since the Australian troops joined the US led coalition. Um, originally, this was conceived in 2019 by journalist, author and filmmaker Anthony Lowenstein and artist Tia Cass, alongside Afghans in Australia, in Afghanistan and the diaspora communities. 20 Years is a multi-platform examination of the war and its aftermath from 20 years of conflict. We focus on the role particularly played by Australia and other Western powers um, in invading and occupying Afghanistan and the consequences of these actions in increasing global Islamophobia and the very real um, responsibility and culpability of the media in how it covered the conflict. It'll feature um, video, audio, portraits, text, photography, journalism, public events, art exhibitions, and the project aims to interrogate the reasons behind this conflict, who lost and who gained, the impact on Afghan civilians and the legacy of the longest war in US history, particularly after the Taliban took over once again in August, 2021. A key aim of the 20 Years Project is to center Afghan voices and our stories, which are routinely ignored in the mainstream media in favor of people who are um, hawkish about war and particularly platforming politicians and those um, from the military apparatus and veteran communities. By working with Afghan civilians, refugees, activists, artists, advocates, this project will show an Afghanistan that has rarely really made it into mainstream media or even into the public consciousness. Phase one of the project launches tonight um, and you know we will have some public events um, and this is part of that too um, where we will discuss globally the ongoing war and um, some of the new artworks and journalism on how civilians have been affected by the conflict. Phase two will launch in 2022 with an exhibition of Afghan artists in Australia, Afghanistan and the diaspora at Black Town Arts Gallery in Sydney, Australia. So we'll be moving um, to Gadigal country, um, hopefully when lockdown lifts and we can get back to some normality of life where we can attend art exhibitions and meet and greet and really engage in that sort of immersive culture, which is very much part of the Afghan uh, way of life. So the exhibition will feature artists such as Kadim Ali, Elias Alavi, Orna Kosimi, and Najiba Nuri, Tia Cass and Anthony Lowenstein. Alongside the exhibition will be a program of public events to discuss the Afghan war. And we really, really encourage people to get onto the website. Um, this is an event that's supported by Australia Council and, the Di and Diversity Arts Australia. And um, I think Claire will share the link in the chat as well, where you can go and find more information. There's all of the portraits, artworks, links to all the artists, um, Instagram pages, their websites, everything can be found on the website 20years.com. So before we go in and in introduce um, our female Afghan artists, I'll just um, introduce myself for some people who may not know me. My name is Diana Sayed. Um, I am a refugee also from Afghanistan. My parents came out to um, what is now, what is, what is Australia um, over 30 years ago. And I came here as a baby. Uh, we were, you know, part of the sort of, there's been multiple waves and everyone has had different migration journeys, um, particular the diaspora who resettled in Iran, Pakistan, who resettled in Europe, some went to the US in Canada, and then some came to Australia and New Zealand. Um, you know, I always say that there is not one story of the Afghan experience, um, because we are all so um, diverse, the plurality that exists amongst us all and um, how fortunate we were in terms of being able to leave at different times during different waves of the conflict um, and how we were able to navigate and rebuild back our lives in um, third countries. 
So um, I have pursued a life working as a lawyer and advocate and campaigner, um, particularly in the human rights space. And I'm now the CEO of the Australian Muslim Women's Centre for Human Rights, working with, again, um, highly vulnerable women, particularly children and their families who have resettled in Australia, um, helping them navigate uh, new lives here. So, um, yeah, I think it's interesting even just talking about where there's so much to unpack and there's so much that's transpired in the last um, six weeks. You know, when this event sort of started to unfold, um, we couldn't even have predicted that we would be in this situation talking about what has happened in the last six months. And it's been yet again a really devastating and, and heartbreaking um, sort of trail of events that have, has unfolded. So, um, we don't want to harp too much on about that because we are here to celebrate some of the art and the culture and the inspiration behind that um, and get into um, a conversation. So um, I would like to introduce um, two highly esteemed artists, um, Najiba Nuri and Orna Kozimi. I'll introduce them separately. Um, Najiba Nuri is um, calling in um, from London. Um, and, oh no, sorry, Orna's in London. Najiba's in Paris. Um, she is from Bomyon in Afghanistan um, and her family immigrated to Iran to escape the ongoing civil war in the country. She started school and brought, was brought up in Iran and she, um, but she went back to Afghanistan to continue her high school in Bomyon. Nuri um, Nur Najiba um, began working for media organizations as a volunteer when she was just 15. Alongside her work, she has practiced photography and videography since 2015. She's also studied photography and filmmaking in Kabul, taking courses provided by the British Council and Sahara Speaks. She has made documentary films and photo stories for various organizations and agencies, including the AFP, Huffington Post, MSF, FMIC, NRC, and the UN in Afghanistan. She joined the AFP as video journalist in August 2019 and in August 2021. She left her country when the Taliban took over. Thank you, Najiba, and welcome. Um, we're going to have a bit more of an interactive session where we can talk through some of the artworks um, as well as sort of um, have a conversation. It's gonna be as interactive as the technology will allow us to be. Um, hopefully you can still see us somewhere on the screen, maybe, not sure. Um, secondly, we've also got Orna Kosimi. Uh, she is an interdisciplinary artist based in London. Her work and research explores her personal encounters of migration in relation to collective memories of displacement through drawings, illustrations, installation, and writing. Her works have been shown at sight and sound workshops at Tate Exchange, Tate Modern London 2018, overprint at, I'm going to butcher some of these French names, gosh, can't even pronounce that, Centre de la Grave, I can't even, no, it's not even going to happen, maybe you can do it, Orna, with your French, um, Art Amongst War, Visual Culture in Afghanistan, um, New Jersey, wow, there's a whole litany here, very impressive, um, but also an amazing art exhibition that you did at Queen's Palace, which I saw some of your work in Afghanistan in 2013. Um, Orna was awarded the Caspian Arts Foundation Scholarship in 2016 and studied at the Central St. Martins in London, where you currently reside. So we've got three female Afghans on the panel, one in Melbourne, got one in London and one in Paris. So let's hopefully the technology doesn't fail us here this evening. Um, but I want to say welcome to you both and thank you for joining us here. And I know it's early morning where you both are. So I struggle to, in the mornings. Welcome, welcome. All right, so um, we'll just jump straight into some of the questions I might throw to um, you, Najiba, because Claire was just showing some of your photographs on the um, on the screen. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about um, sort of your inspiration, having grown up in Bamiyan and then living in, in Iran and then going back and some of the phenomenal sort of culture and life that you captured in some of your photography and your inspiration behind that? 
Hello, everyone. Um, yes, um, I uh, when I was uh, a kid, uh, so we came back from Iran, as as you say, uh, to Afghanistan, and uh, I grew up in Bamiyan, in a very peaceful province. So I started uh, photography and videography from Bamiyan, and. Uh, when I started working in Bamiyan, I would go to the villages of Bamiyan to photograph uh, women. So uh, it was, uh, I mean, it was, you know, like it was really nice to go to the villages and to see the women and I could see like how much, you know, um, these women are like powerful uh, um, despite of the challenges, you know, like uh, uh, central highlands of Afghanistan, especially like these uh, provinces like Bamiyan, Daikundi, they are, uh, I would say like, um, uh, these women, they were living in a very poor families, but I could see like, you know, despite of uh, um, these, you know, from the poor families, how much they are, uh, eager to learn the uh, you know new things that at the age of 50 60 um, you can see like the pictures they wanted you know to learn how to write how to how to read and uh, uh, and the first time I could see a young girl uh, she was riding a bike for me you know as a one girl it was like surprising and then I started photography. You can see the picture here. She was just 15 and 16 years old. You know, that's why I started to telling these stories more and more. And I was really interested, you know, to do more photography in the villages of Afghanistan than the city. So, and then um, I moved uh, to Kabul and uh, new challenges started actually from Kabul, you know going from a very peaceful and secure province like uh, Bamiyan uh, to, to the Kabul city. It was, you know, quite big different. And uh, especially when I started working for IFB, Agence France Press, as a journalist, so new challenges started for me, you know, like especially in these uh, a uh, few years uh, when the violence getting worse and worse, attacks, explosions, and I, and I used to go to the you know cover the these attacks, explosions. So thanks to Taqi, uh, that uh, I mean the song it was really beautiful and it remembered you know me to that day uh, that uh, that bomb blast happened and. Uh, Saidu Shahadai school because the next day I went for coverage and you know like I could see that uh, I mean for me it was like uh, very difficult you know to do my job and at the same time I couldn't like um, control myself because you know these young girls how you know how they could do to these young girls you know like uh, they were just, uh, you know, studying and uh, and it was for me difficult to do my job, you know, and to, to take video, to take uh, photos. And this song, I could really like feel it, you know, uh, because that day was, uh, you know, I could see like uh, how much uh, those, uh, their fathers, their, their moms, you know, their families, their relatives, they carrying uh, those bodies to the cemetery. And it was a tough day for me, uh, you know, to cover that story. And uh, same, you know, with Kabul University, with educational centers. And, you know, these explosions happened in Hazara area, Dashte uh, Barchi. And uh, and as you said, you know, this explosion uh, in, in these uh, last uh, years, it was, you know, 
uh, getting more and more against the Hazara uh, minority in Afghanistan. So, yeah, uh, new challenges started in, in Kabul and I just continued my work. I worked for AFP uh, for two years and then in August 15, you know, that what happened to our country and I had to leave. Although I really don't want it to leave, but I forced to leave my country because in, in Taliban uh, regime in 1919, I was, uh, I was not in Afghanistan. And what I saw from that time was just the videos, you know, just the pictures and the social media. So, and uh, I, I thought it's, you know, like uh, if I stay in the country, of course, it would be not possible to continue my work as a video journalist to have my camera and my work is, you know, to go to the street, to go to the, uh, to the, you know, to the provinces and to tell these stories. So, and especially as a Hazara woman, you know, it was not possible. And you can see like now how much uh, Afghan women are suffering. And uh, most of them, journalists, artists, activists, they are just staying at home. So some of them, they have uh, already left the country. And of course, like um, a lot of them are still in Kabul and they're stuck in Kabul. You can see like Taliban, they just, you know, uh, stop them from just their basic rights, you know, to get education, to, to go to outside uh, to work. Uh, yes, this is my story. And a lot there, um, Najiba John, and thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, I think your testament to the, um, the Afghan saying around how much women have to endure um, tahmul, like we have to go through and experience so much just to pursue our own artistic and creative um, pursuits and, you know, coming from a beautiful place like Bomyon and capturing the exquisite landscape, um, you know, like that's something that um, often doesn't make it into mainstream media and just seeing the lives of, um, you know, the villages and the beauty and pure purity of those images really is not something that we get um, access to very often. So even your work in Bomyon and then again in Kabul really was so vital, even for those um, living abroad in the diaspora community, it was so valuable for us to kind of have that insight and, you know, the ongoing trauma that we all experience, whether we based in Kabul or having to forcibly flee, you know, we live through those memories and those images now because we don't have anything else really. Uh, so it, it's incumbent on us to capture the history and to capture the landscape and the people that very much continue to make up the, the land um, of our Watan. But I, I, yeah, I just think it's so incredible and you don't have to obviously talk about your um, current situation or your experience or what you went through over the last two months. Um, but, you know, Najiba, I, I know that it's just been such a tough time for so many, so many, um, particularly, you know, when we all were hopeful that the 20 years and the withdrawal could have allowed, you know, Afghanistan to really come into its own. But unfortunately, what we've seen hasn't eventuated. But, um, yeah, with music being banned, particularly like someone like Taki Khan not being able to perform in Afghanistan just breaks my heart. Um, I will I will come back to you, Najiba, but I do want to come to Orna as well and just um, talk to talk to you about some of your work and some of the work that you've done. Incredible installation art, some of the illustrations, some of the work that you've done through your writing, and you know I think for a lot of people. Um, around the world, really, their artistic pursuits are very much informed by our lived experience, by our families' migration journeys, our histories that continue to live on in us. It's ingrained in us at a cellular level. If, if you've ever had hardship and, and sort of um, a lot of um, heartbreak in your life, often that becomes the, the inspiration for your art. Um, but unfortunately for Afghans, that heartbreak has never ceased to exist. We just, our hearts continue to break 
over and over and over again. And you touch on a bit about trauma in some of your work. So I'm curious to know a little bit more about, about that and your inspiration behind your, your artwork, Lorena Jan. Thank you, Diana. Uh, yeah, as you said, uh, lived experiences uh, sort of drives my work. Uh, my parents uh, moved to Iran during the first displacement in, during the 80s, and I'm born as Afghan in Iran. Then uh, we, well, yeah, the, the, the difficulties and uh, discriminations against Afghans in Iran is uh, is really uh, difficult, uh, making difficult for for uh, for Afghans to, and they are denied of their basic rights to education, to employment, and uh, so I started my my practice, art practice there, and. Uh, I left Iran in 2013. Uh, I, I, I went to Afghanistan. And uh, so these works that we are saying, seeing here, they are um, uh, produced during uh, my stay in Afghanistan. So uh, yeah, I think I'm quite uh, uh, this Afghan identity. I think uh, part of this identity is displacement, is trauma and uh, which these are also the main theme that uh, comes back in different forms based on the, you know different in different states of my life so these these ones are in afghanistan i was very uh shocked and and this, uh, to see uh the very large number of uh, uh people with uh, with disability and amputation as a result of war in afghanistan and I felt like visually it impacted me massively that it became one of the main themes for my artworks. And uh, later on, I, I saw this as a very, uh, you know, uh, visible impact of war, really clear, you see on the street, you, you can't just deny it. But then there is also another, another impact to, uh, which is a bit hidden and maybe uh, not very often talked about, which is trauma of all these sort of, you know, uh, displacement and, uh, and uh, this identity. Uh, so I um, sort of uh, worked on also trauma in, in uh, writing and in installations like uh, more of got interested in how, how a person can leave the past through the present as if like the present isn't there it's just like a scheme to to leave the past and uh, went back to the characters of uh, uh, like as you see Babu Babu is a character in in, in this writing that uh, that represent is, is like a, is like a metaphor for for a person who doesn't have a place to stay so it's uh, so he's his smile is too wide to to fit anywhere. So he goes and and, and he disappears and he, he goes to Mirage, becomes a Mirage. So it's all like I collected these sort of metaphors and stories about uh, you know these characters, this idea of uh, you know displacement and uh, and uh, this uh, this story of uh, for instance this this. Uh, uh, a story of a, a, a girl that uh, she's diagnosed that she has a catfish in her, in her brain and this catfish moves and and it triggers uh, memories uh, and uh, which this catfish is is a metaphor for trauma how how um, a person can get drawn in itself so so yeah, it's all is sort of exploration into the lived experiences, and uh, yeah, and telling the stories of 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 uh, this shared uh, and collective, you know. Thank you, Orna Jan, and thank you for sharing your uh, artwork with us and speaking to it. It's really powerful to hear directly from an artist about their inspiration and, and often, 
you know, we, we think about art as a, a luxury, a, a pleasure, an afterthought when all of our other basic survival needs are taken care of, like food, water, shelter, um, and other care. But actually art is sustenance for people who have gone through so much trauma. It's a way of actually being able to articulate their experiences and it's almost becomes a healing journey and process in and of itself um, for, for those who, you know, might not actually know how to express some of those emotions that might come up or when, when we see footage of images on the media and you know we our hearts obviously pounding and and it's part of that trauma and you know when we 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 witness it it's like um it's happening to us all over again um because our intergenerational trauma and the trauma is inbuilt into our dna so it's very much like it's happening all over again and we never quite recover as a, as a community from that trauma so thank you for sharing that. It's incredibly powerful. Yeah, it's, I think it's quite a form of resistance. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's stories you read in media, but I think uh, uh, artists as a visual storytellers has this power of showing a deeper human, more human aspect of these stories. And uh, mainly uh, they might not even be reflected in, in mainstream media. So it is itself, it's, I, I believe in social function of really art. And, and the power it has. Absolutely. And look, I'm a human rights activist and community organizer and um, an advocate, you know, through my, my lawyering work. I absolutely, culture and art, language, poetry, music, it has historically always been perceived as quite subversive because it's a way of people connecting it's a way of us dreaming and reimagining a better world. And it really conjures all of that um, because, you know, we, I, I would worry about what the human race would be without arts and culture, because that is really what grounds us and what makes us who we are. And it, it def it's defined by our history, our roots and language is such an incredible thing to, to, to have. And often, you know, I, I grieve, that um, I grieve the loss of that when you are forcibly displaced off your off your ancestral homelands and even that picture that you put up about Bobu not f feeling like he fits in anyway because his smile is too big that's incredible I feel like sometimes my heart's too big I don't know where to go to fit in or to be accepted because you know you just once your roots have been severed like that, and you know, for generations and thousands and thousands of years, we've resided in Afghanistan. And once you've been displaced as a diaspora community, where is home? That's a constant, constant conundrum. Um, so where is home for, for, for Najiba? That, that's a good question. That's a good segue to talk about um, your experience in the last, if you feel comfortable talking about it in any, any detail. Um, but where is home for you now that you've had to sort of flee under such incredible circumstances? And, you know, we're, we're so, we're always so relieved when, when we know that, um, artists and those some people who are leading the some of the um, change particularly women have sought safety outside of the country when things like this happen so really keen to hear about your journey and and potentially even if you want to talk a bit more about like what are your plans around your art uh, now that you're in Paris thank you Diana John uh, well um... I would like to speak a bit uh, about what I went through uh, in, uh, two months ago, 15th of August. So uh, 15th of August was, uh, you know, a big surprise and a big shock for everybody because we didn't expect actually that Taliban would take over uh, Afghanistan or, uh, you know, like, uh, especially like Kabul. So, and, uh, and especially we didn't expect that, you know, Taliban came and, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, take the whole country like this, you know, very easily. 
So in the morning, I was uh, at the office. And in the afternoon, when I came back to home, I saw like the Taliban in front of my house, you know, which was shocking. I was like shocked, you know, totally. Uh, and I was confused. What, what should I do, you know, right now? Taliban are like firing. Uh, they were firing in the streets. They were uh, walking, you know. And people were, you know, like very confused. Those people that they had their visas uh, or their tickets, they they were trying to get to the airport, you know, to leave the country. And the, you know, at that day, fifteen uh, of August, uh, you know, the crowds at the airport, you know, like um, in the streets, that uh, traffic jam in the streets, it just was you know it started and it was really complicated you know you, you uh, or most of the people in the world they saw that what happened to afghanistan you know like um at the airport that explosions and that chaotic and that you know like crowds so everybody was trying to leave the country including myself you know because uh, of course, you know, a, a, a terrorist of um, a group of terrorists came to our country and they just uh, took our country like this very easily. And uh, uh, the group of terrorists that they, you know, they have been killing uh, my people, you know, my generation, you know, since years. And how can I accept, you know, to be like under their control? How, how can I leave? especially that they they are against women they are against like education uh, actually um, they are against uh, powerful women they are actually afraid of women i would say you know because during these years that uh, we have achieved many things and they could see you know how much um, uh, women they improve themselves you know in any field uh, field so uh, we have many skilled women and uh, we were really improving uh, in any field. I personally, my work is documentary, uh, document, you know, uh, filmmaking documentary and photography. So for me, it's a huge importance to be in my country, you know, and to tell uh, and to be in the ground, you know, to see like uh, people, to speak to them, you know and uh, to, to tell their stories, you know, by uh, my own camera as it's like documentary, you know. So uh, for me, it was really difficult because I was working in my uh, two of my uh, uh, film documentary. I had these two projects and I was working. Um, and, you know, now it's, I couldn't finish it, you know. My my characters are still in Kabul and they're stuck there, and I am like uh, very very worried for them. So, yeah, uh, it was very difficult that night. I remember I was confused, but I decided my toughest you know decision in my whole life. Um, I left my home. I couldn't take you know. I just could take my camera my hard drives um, and one of my Hazaragi clothes, which I really love it. So it came from Bamiyan. I could, uh, you know, took them and uh, go to the uh, French embassy. And it was not easy at the midnight to leave your home, you know, just uh, to lock it, to lock your door and leave, the, leave your home, you know. And the streets are full of Taliban with the Afghan security um, workers and they were just, you know, walking in the streets. So I passed many checkpoints on that night um, and I was like fully covered. Um, at the last checkpoints, Taliban were not allowing me, you know, to, to enter the, the embassy. It was a crowd. Uh, uh, and it was like many uh, Taliban and, uh, uh, and and they were not allowing me. So I was just keep uh, telling them uh, I need to go to, to the embassy. And actually they, they were, um, there was a commander I remembered 
So they were actually like angry, you know, at me that how this woman could stand in front of us and speaking to us. I could see like how much he is angry. I could see from his, from their faces, you know. But for me, when I'm thinking now, I mean, uh, I, I was standing in front of them and talking to them. I, I need to go and, uh, you know, like they were not allowing me after speaking, speaking, calling uh, embassy. So I could make it. And I would say that I was lucky, very, very lucky that I made it because they would, you know, um, there was no one in the streets and they could, I don't know, they could kill me, you know. So, but I mean, I made it, it was a big shock. I mean, still I'm shocked, uh, but I, I made it. For me, it's very, you know, I could work from here, from Paris, but it would be more difficult, you know, for me. Now I'm as a, as a refugee. Um, maybe I could finish my projects here, you know, those that I couldn't finish in Afghanistan. Of course, I will continue my work. Uh, here so but it will be you know a big challenge for me you know to come to a new country uh, to start a new life a new language uh, it will be you know challenging and will be very much difficult no doubt no doubt any refugees experience is not easy and you know that's something that we've We've said on repeat here in Australia that no one chooses to leave their homes unless where their homes are no longer safe for them or their families. And you touched upon, upon a really important point about Afghan women. And, you know, um, often people um, have had to reframe their ideas about Afghan women because um, after the Taliban fell, um, after the Taliban, I wish, after the um, Kabul fell to the Taliban, we did see for those first few weeks a lot of um, women that took to the streets that were protesting against the Taliban, who wanted to go to school, who wanted to go to university, who wanted to go back to their jobs and resume working. And for me, one of the biggest things about the movement and the um, civil sort of action that they took in their peaceful protesting against that was the courage that we witnessed of Afghan women in the face of so much adversity and fear that was palpable that they were they just would not accept um, that they could be denied rights in the country and it was incredible to see that um, level of, of courage and resilience but to the Afghans, we're used to that. That's not something or an image that we haven't seen from our mothers and grandmothers and sisters and children and daughters. It's just that the Western media doesn't want to portray that. And for me, it was surprising that that didn't get um, as much pickup in the media, particularly of women standing with their full chest in front with unarmed, um, with their, you know, with their handbags and their signs um, with the, you know, in front of these Taliban um, fully armed, fully clothed men. And they're, they're, they just had no fear because for them, there, there is no life without education or having their rights. Um, and that was remarkable to, to witness, um, but it just didn't get media pickup. Those images didn't go viral. I didn't see it go viral. And that was a bit um, disappointing to me as well, um, particularly, you know, off the back of the last two years where the rest of the world's been going through global pandemic and we live through social media now, particularly for us in lockdown. So that was, a, that was definitely um, something that I questioned in terms of what, what we were getting fed here and not getting access to. So thank you for that, Najiba. And yeah, it's, I think your journey is only just, only just starting and your star continuing to rise. Um, so Orna John, I'll, I'll ask you as well, sort of a bit more about your art and where do you see, because, you know, obviously you're growing up in Iran and, you know, the implications of having the Taliban come back 
into power. I think people seem to think that they exist in some sort of a vacuum in the region, whereas we know very much as Afghans that it's always been a geopolitical sort of intervention, whether it was, you know, from the US that Australia was very much part of over the last 20 years, or it's Iran with its own agenda, Pakistan predominantly so, um, Russia, China now as well. So you, you talked a little bit about how growing up in Iran also informed some of your art. And what does that mean with the Taliban now back, um, back in power? Does that sort of have implications for your ability to travel to Iran? Or what would that mean for you now and your family? Um, thank you, Diana, for this question, because um, yeah, the, the return of Taliban uh, is not only uh, affecting the lives of Afghans inside uh, Afghanistan, but also a large number of Afghans like myself, they live in Iran. And uh, for new generation like me born in Iran is going, you know, this idea of we sort of a generation with this uh, like idea of returning and rebuilding Afghanistan. It was sort of an inspiration for, for taking the challenges in Iran, for going to university while knowing that we, we, we won't have any job in, in Iran or any, we don't belong there. So the, uh, but the still is the inspiration for this generation to take the challenges to go to university with all financial and, 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 um, and discrimination. One was that mainly we will go to uh, Afghanistan. We will be part of a change. You know, it would have give a sense of purpose as well as, um, you know, it's like, okay, we, re we belong to a country and we can be a part of a change. And we, we had this chance of, uh, uh, lots of programs were also in place to, to help new generation born in, in Iran that couldn't sort of find a way to go back to Afghanistan. And, uh, and like after the fall of Taliban in 2001, there was a huge wave of, uh, you know, going back to, 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 Iran, uh, to Afghanistan. And it continued by, you know, uh, educated uh, generation in Iran. So it's now, um, it's true that they are safe. And of, of obviously uh, the way that is impacted uh, residents of Afghanistan is very different from those who are in Iran, but still, I feel like, uh, you know, this loss of hope, you know, is 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 huge. It's it can be fatal as well. You know, when you, your uh, your hope is taken away, you in Iran you continuously uh, are denied of belonging, denied of basic rights. You always hear that you um, you have another country, and now that country is not even there anymore. There is not the the option of this rebuilding. You will belong, and you will you know uh, you will be part of change. Is not there, so uh, I feel it's is 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 it will sort of have a huge impact uh, on the way that uh, need this new generation would think of their future in terms of taking decisions for going to university because uh, the right for education is not very easy in Iran. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. Uh, so I, I'm not quite sure if I covered <laughs> all your questions. Oh. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I think that's really important because that's something that often we don't understand that, um, you know, Afghans have been um, systematically denied access to education, to housing, um, even a pathway to citizenship in Iran um, because of the waves and influx of refugees over the last decades, if not four decades as well. And that's not too dissimilar to what Australia, so-called Australia, has done here as well to stimmy the flow of uh, refugees who rightly have... Um, you know, are able to seek asylum here safely. And, um, you know, what's been really disappointing for us in the diaspora community, particularly from Australia, is that there is a lot of similarities to what Iran's doing to Afghans, how Pakistan treats mm -hmm. Afghans, how, you know, Australia now has really not 
fulfilled its obligations or commitment to Afghans after being there for 20 years. We saw the US accept, you know, nearly 95,000 Afghans. Canada upped their number to 40,000. Um, we've seen um, the UK as well with 20,000. France even, even as Islamophobic as they are. Um, and other countries around the world sort of pledging to support Afghans and the refugees that are fleeing a life under the Taliban. Yet Australia, that was very much part of the 20 year coalition and, and reconstruction efforts. Um, and then, you know, just shirking their responsibility. So it's really, it's really hard because where have Afghans got to go? Where, what are our options? And I think that notion of hope has also been stripped away from us. And, you know, it's not an easy choice to make to leave your homeland, but where is the dignity and the choices that we have available to us? If we can't go to Iran and live a life there of dignity, if Pakistan is the same, where do we go? And we are a landlocked country as well. So our options are, are pretty limiting. Um, I'm always constantly disappointed by, by Western states who, who who are very um, keen to get involved in the intervention, but um, when it comes to responsibility, they will shirk that. Um, so I'll also, I'll take turn to you now, um, again, Najiba John, and just for those who are calling in on the Zoom, we'll go to questions in a bit as well, and we can open it up. We're on till 7.30. So I'll um, come to some questions, but um, I think, you know, we'll open it up now. If people do have any questions or in the Zoom chat, please um, feel free to put in some questions. If you'd like, um, we can answer them and have a bit more of a three-way conversation. If um, Najiba wants to talk to Orna, like I don't have to be in the middle there. You guys can chat as artists, as people living now, all of us living in the diaspora, continuing our art. You know, I throw it to either of you. Um, what does this mean for the future of art in Afghanistan? Like, is this going to be a future for art? I really worry about an artless Afghanistan and what does that mean for people's um, ability to reimagine a better world and a better country? Either of you can jump in. Well, I think uh, before Taliban came to Kabul, we have had already many challenges, you know, especially for women artists. But with the current situation, I think it's gonna be, you know, tough be because Taliban, they, you know, they don't want, you know, arts in, in Afghanistan. So in, the, in their first days of their power, they closed the uh, art faculty in Kabul University. They closed the National uh, Institute of um, Music in, in Kabul. You know, like um, many of them, and they were like uh, scared day by themselves. They were, you know, burning their their arts, their paints. If you if you saw those pictures in, in social media, it's gonna be tough. But I personally, I can't, you know, imagine a country without art, you know. Uh, you know, for me, uh, well, for me, uh, I mean, uh, what I experience, I think um, two, two things could be, you know, make a country, uh, women and culture, you know. So it's huge importance um that unfortunately now in the current situation we don't have you know like none of them because taliban are against them you know and and they are they are trying to silence these um these voices voices of women voices of artists you know journalists activists and it's very very difficult for women and uh uh, yes, uh, th there are women that uh, uh, they are resisting. Um, I mean, you talked about those women that uh, they, you know, protested in the streets. Uh, for me, they are the bravest women, uh, and uh, and you know, on those days when they were in the streets, and I was just, you know, I I, I know some of those women that they were protesting 
and uh, on those days i wish that you know i was actually like regretted why i i left my country i wished i was there you know alongside these women you know protesting and you know asking for my rights but uh, still i think there are some activities that women are um, doing that uh, so far but what i know i know some of the artist women is still they are doing their job i know personally one of my friends uh, she's photographer and videographer she's uh, documenting and collecting and you know uh, these uh, photos interviews from uh, from uh, especially like women and she is working she's not in the streets uh, she's not covering you know um, you know like the news or uh, this protest because it will be you know dangerous for her uh, it's, i mean it's already dangerous for female uh, for male uh, journalist and photographer and videographer so she's doing how can i say like um, underground so she's documenting uh, and i'm really like trying to help her how how we could work together you know now this is time to work together those people that they are out of their country they can work from like me and here i can you know uh, and, and she is in uh, in kabul so we can work together and you know find uh, um some where you know some places i don't know medias and galleries you know like festivals to to present you know or to show these works so yeah it's it's gonna be a um, tough situation because the taliban they're just liar you know they're just um you know um, making uh, situation for men you know they're just you know uh, uh, starting uh, started like more um, uh, uh, um, um, stupid rules uh, for women and um, yeah I, I think it's gonna be really tough for women yeah can i add something <laughs> um yeah i think uh, well, Taliban are very famous for, you know, blasting Bhutto's statues and generally destroying uh, historical sites and totally being against uh, cultural heritage. Uh, well, now they, they painted over murals in, in, in Kabul, they, they replaced them with, uh, with uh, Islamic uh, slogans and their flag. So it's, I think it's very, it, they just, um, it's very clear how they think about art and it's very clear how they responded. They just more clever in a way that how to convey messages, uh, you know, rather than to be as, uh, you know, straight. So they do, they still, they, they are against, they see this, um, they see art, the very nature of art as a declaration of war to their ideology. Uh, and, uh, and they still do. And I think art, unfortunately, again, is uh, one of the biggest casualties of this war. And, uh, and yeah, I think it will be very difficult, uh, especially that still we don't know what will happen slowly after the attention of media uh, disappear and they will have, uh, you know, uh, more sort of they they are doing things but we i think mainly everyone fear uh how they how they gonna slowly show their face their faces uh, so um yeah the, the 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 future of art especially with this um uh with what's unfolding in afghanistan is quite dark and um and i hope that it can at least go underground and find a way of resistance. But it's, it's, it's quite dangerous to expect, you know, um, to expect that, um, yeah. Thank you, Orla John and Najiba John. That was remarkable. And I do 
agree with all of you in terms of um, art and culture is what sustains us, particularly in our darkest of moments and in times of hardship, we often turn to music and poetry and literature and art and it has a way of transcending us out of our current state, no matter how we're feeling, it really has that um, ability to affect our mental health and um, conjure up memories of our ancestors and our homes and you know, even here in Nam, over the last sort of 18 to two months to two years during the pandemic, and, you know, we're now the longest city in lockdown, our art scene, I've missed it more than anything, because um, Melbourne has just really been that city that sustains you in a way that um, I don't think any other city in Australia really does. And um, I just hope that that comes back. And I just can't even imagine not having that as an option um, in Afghanistan going forward, um, particularly given the history of, of the art and how it's um, really informed so much of, of who we are and our culture and our traditions as well. Uh, the grief is palpable, um, but because we're not seeing any, any questions in the chat box, we're actually gonna play um, one of Orna's um, films. Um, so um, it's about two, one of the, her videos. It's about um, two minutes. Um, but thank you to everyone who has attended tonight. Um, I think, you know, we'll, we'll go out by saying thank you to everyone. Please do visit the 20years.com website and all the donations that you've made um, on both nights will go to the Afghan Australian Development Organisation. It's an NGO that was started by Dr. Nuria Salehi AOM. Um, and it's all about um, educating Afghan youth who once again will be the future of the country. Um, and there we've confirmed that their work has in fact been able to continue even um, despite the Taliban takeover. So um, we've already raised nearly $2,000 for them. So please keep those donations coming. But in the interim, I, we will throw to um, Orna's video to take us out. But I would like to say thank you again to Orna John and Najiba John and Taki John and Anthony and Tia also for organizing through Diversity Arts and um, the Australian Council. Um, thank you to everyone. And please stay for the next two minutes where Orna's video will be playing for us. Thank you and good night, everyone. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> no,